Mary Ann Seacart is a familiar and authoritative speaker, writer and broadcaster. She spent 20 years as an assistant editor and columnist on The Times, as well as a welcome broadcaster on Radio 4 in many programmes, including The Week in Westminster and Analysis. She's a visiting professor at King's College London. Can you mute yourselves, please, everybody? And she's also a non-executive director of the Guardian Media Group. She was the uh, chair of the Social Mar Market Foundation until 2021. Marianne won a scholarship to Wadham College when she was 16. Uh, so has made good use of her time. Her website is MarianneSeekhart.com. You can also follow her on Twitter at Marianne Seekhart. No surprises there. M.A. Seekhart, actually. M.A. <laughs> yes. I beg your pardon. Right. She has a portfolio career and tells us that she herself was the recipient of a, of a very rude retort. <laughs> <laughs> a very rude retort when she was asked what she did. You're a busy little girl. She was 50 at the time. I was Mary older Anne. than Prime Minister. The then Prime Minister? Yeah, mm. I was older than him, but I was a busy little girl to this man. Yeah. Terrible, <laughs> isn't it? And Marianne had a, a year as a visiting fellow of All Souls College, Oxford, which gave her the opportunity to write this incredible book, The Authority Gap, which I read in a constant blaze of horrified incredulity and recognition. Uh, Marianne, what was it that made you want to put this topic on your list when you went to um, All Souls? Well, I had thought of writing a book about politics because I've spent most of my life as a political columnist and that seemed the obvious thing. You've gone on, that's it. Ah, yeah. hey, I thought I had on me to myself. Did, I, did you hear any of that? Um, not okay. much of it. I had thought of writing a book about politics because that was what I had spent most of my life doing. Uh, uh, being a political columnist and you know my head was there but my heart wasn't really in it and I had this idea for writing a book about how we still take women less seriously than men it's something that I've noticed all through my life and I'm sure pretty much every woman on this call has in fact almost every woman in the world probably has uh, but I guess I probably felt that I had to earn my spurs in a man's world before any men would take it seriously <laughs> which is sort of QED really, isn't it? Um, and so, you know, I had to be a business journalist and then a political journalist. And it was only really towards the end of my journalistic career that I really felt that if I wrote a book like this, men would read it as well as women. And frankly, the world won't change unless men read this book as well as women, because I'll just be preaching to the choir. So I tried it out on, a, on a, an existing fellow of All Souls because I had to do this application to become a visiting fellow. And I, and, I, and I tried out about three books about politics, ideas to him, and then this one. And he said, that's the one you should do. They would love that. And I said, really? <laughs> uh, isn't it quite a conservative college? And he said, no, absolutely. It's exactly what they would love. And I was thrilled he said it because it was what I really wanted to do. Is that Lord, Lord Waldegrave? Yeah, it was actually. <laughs> yeah, no, it's a great idea and it's a really good book. And, 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 and obviously it's in our interest as women for, for us to be taken more seriously. Um, how is it, how can men benefit as well as women? Do you know, this actually cheered me up more than any of the research I did in the book, because I thought that gender equality would be like a seesaw, you know, as women rise, men fall, and it's, to mix my metaphors, it's a zero sum game. Uh, but actually, what all the academic evidence shows is that both in more gender equal countries and in more gender equal relationships, straight relationships, that is, in which the man and the woman share the chores and the childcare and pretty much all the unpaid work equally. Not only are the women happier and healthier, which you might well expect, and the children are happier and healthier and they do better at school and they have fewer behavioral difficulties and the girls have more ambition for themselves and they have a better relationship with their dad. But the men are also happier and healthier and they are, they are twice as likely to say they're satisfied with their lives, half as likely to be depressed, much less likely to get divorced. They tend to drink less, smoke less, take fewer drugs, sleep better at night. And here is the absolute clincher, they get more frequent and better sex. 
So guys, <laughs> this is very much in your interest. Very much a win-win then, isn't it's it? It's a win-win. But actually, anecdotally, you can tell, you know, if you treat a woman with as much respect as you treat the men that you know, if you listen to her just as attentively, if you, res- if you just value her as highly as your male colleagues, she will absolutely love you. She will notice it. She will appreciate it. I mean, we all know men who do behave like that. They're in a minority, but we all know men who do, and they are fantastic. And we get on much better with them as a result. And so therefore for men, you will find that your female colleagues like you more if you do that. They will be more engaged. They will work harder. They will be more loyal. When it comes to your personal life, I I tell a story in the book about um, a friend of mine's son who comes home from university and he says, dad, I've discovered the secret to pulling girls. So my friend says, oh, really, Tom, what's that? And he says, well, it's quite simple, really. All you have to do is listen to what they say. (laughs) (laughs) And really, that that is the message of the book. You know, please just listen to what we say as much as you listen to what men say and value it as highly, and the world will be a much better place for us both. Yeah, that's that's a great message. Um, Now, the list of of women you interviewed for this book it's absolutely stellar, isn't it? And um, did you ask them all the same basic questions? Um, yes. I mean, I, I interviewed about, well, I interviewed about 100 women for the book, of whom about half were already extremely successful, powerful, authoritative. And I deliberately included those, partly because I'd be, I was fascinated to see what they had to say, um, but also because I thought if even they have experienced the authority gap, And I need, by the way, to tell the audience what it is, um, which I'll do in a sec. But if even they have experienced it, then that's pretty good proof that the rest of humankind, uh, sorry, the rest of womankind has. And all of them, I think, to to a woman said, yes, they had experienced being underestimated, being mistaken for the secretary, being patronized, being interrupted or talked over, having their views ignored in meetings having their expertise challenged and having their authority resisted. And these are sort of manifestations of the authority gap, how it plays out in everyday life. And they all had amazing stories to tell. Would you like to hear one or two? Yeah, <laughs> I, I think possibly the most shocking was Mary McAleese when she was president of Ireland and she led a delegation to the Vatican to meet the Pope. So very, very formal occasion, state visit. And there she is in the audience room at the head of her delegation and in comes the Pope flanked by his cardinals to be introduced to the president. He walks straight past her, sticks out his hand to her husband instead and says, wouldn't you prefer to be president of Ireland rather than married to the president of Ireland? The delegation was stunned. They couldn't believe this rudeness or breach of protocol. Uh, So her husband, of course, knew better than to take the bait. And she told me that she grabbed the Pope's hand, which was hovering in midair, brought it back to herself and said, let me introduce myself. I am the president of Ireland, Mary McAleese, elected by the people of Ireland, whether you like it or whether you don't. Excellent. (laughs) (laughs) A really great comeback. Doing that to a head of state. And he said, oh, I'm sorry, I was only joking. And she said, well, no, you said, I heard you had a sense of humour. And she said, well, I do have a sense of humour, but that wasn't funny because you wouldn't have said that to a male president. I think this is the big question, isn't it? And I think that's the question that you ask people to contemplate time and again. Um, I I think uh, Professor Richardson says it as well at one point in your book. Yes. Yeah. So this is Louise Richardson and she runs University of Oxford, by many measures, the best university in the world. And she has to preside at an event called Congregation, which is in effect the university parliament. Very formal occasion, 350 people, and she literally sits on a throne. So you don't get more formal or grander than that. And she had done this dozens of times. And there she was in mid-speech, delivering her speech to Congregation, when a male junior of hers, for whom it was his first ever time, touched her on the sleeve and said, no, you've got it wrong, you should be reading this. In the middle of her speech, challenging her authority. Could you mute yourselves, please? Because I'm finding this quite distracting. Thank you. Um, In the middle of her speech, interrupting a speech, and she was horrified. She turned to him and said, No, I've got it right. Yes, I think. 
Sorry, please mute yourselves, everybody. It's uh, very poli impolite. Thank you. Um, she said, actually, I got it right. And she carried on. And then the next day she called him in and said, I'd just like to ask yourself, because I did my mental, this mental experiment last night, would you have done that if I'd been a male vice chancellor? And he said, oh, I'm so sorry. Um, it was my mistake. I hadn't done one of these before. She said, precisely. I'd done them dozens of times. You hadn't done it before. And yet you had the nerve to interrupt me and tell me I was getting it wrong. She said, I'd like you to do that mental experiment. And I do just call on people in the book to do that mental experiment. Just ask yourselves, would I have done that to a man if you've done something like that to a woman? If the, if the answer is no, just stop it, please. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, uh, I thought that it was really interesting looking at chapter three, uh, where you were looking at the experiences of people who transition. I thought that was a really interesting use of those statistics. Um, like Professor Ben Barris, her experience as Barbara was vastly different from his later life as Ben, uh, but was astonished at the difference and, and really points up how unfair life is for women in any sort of position. Um, mm. Do you want to talk about that and, yeah, and possibly yeah. Joan Rough Garden as well? Sure, yes. I, I found this fascinating because in any everyday situation, it's very hard to prove bias. So suppose you're a woman and you're up for a promotion against your male colleague and he gets it and you don't. And, and you may suspect that bias was at play, but it's very hard to prove because you're different people. And after all, he may just be better than you. But the experience of trans people allows you to control for every other variable and isolate the only one that matters, which is gender, because they're exactly the same person, you know, with the same intelligence and ability and experience and personality and body of work. And if people react to them completely differently once they see them as a different gender, I think that is pretty good evidence to prove that the authority gap exists. So I tell the story of these two Stanford science professors, Ben Barris and Joan Roughgarden, who happened by chance to transition in opposite directions at the same time, and they used to compare notes. And Ben Barris, who was a neuroscientist, once he started living as a man, he said, I've had the thought a million times, I'm just taken more seriously now. My work's taken more seriously. The same damned work, as he put it, is taken more seriously now that people see me as a man. And someone who didn't know his history was overheard saying at the back of one of his seminars, oh, Ben Barris gave a great seminar today, but then his work's so much better than his sister's, <laughs> i.e. his own. <laughs> and meanwhile, sorry? Unbelievable. Yeah, yeah. And meanwhile, Joan Roughgarden, who is an evolutionary biologist, transitioned in the opposite direction. And she says, when she was living as a man, she just felt like she was on this conveyor belt to success. She said it was just all so easy. People respected her, they respected her work. She spoke, people listened. She was on the university Senate committee. She got tenure, life was really, really easy. Once she started living as a woman, all that changed. And she came up against all these instances of authority gap behavior that I talked about before. And she said, well, to start with, I thought if I'm going to live as a woman, I'm darn well going to be discriminated against like a woman. And then she said, well, the thrill of that has worn off, I can tell you. And what she was most upset by, actually, was the way she used to be attacked personally once she started living as a woman. And people would shout at her and they would say things like, you haven't read the literature. She said, no one ever did that to me when they saw me as a man. And her conclusion was, men are assumed to be competent until proven otherwise, and women are assumed to be incompetent until they prove otherwise. And actually much bigger studies of trans people done by sociologists have found exactly the same phenomenon in both directions. Trans men say, this is wonderful. I'm so much more respected now, life is so much easier. And trans women say, I had no idea of the extent of sexism until I started living as a woman. Now I understand it. Yeah, I think we, we know from our own experience, don't we, how, yeah. how hard it can be, but it's, it's good to have some uh, reinforcement. There's another a story as well, the problem of Martin Schneider and Nicole Halberg, uh, which also de demonstrates the sex discrimination, um, which I seem to remember from reading about online some time ago. Can you yes. tell us? Yeah, so these were two colleagues, um, 
in a on a I think it was on a magazine anyway and her boss used to complain that she was so slow at getting deals done and she said that's because it just takes me ages for people to reply to me on email and he and the boss just thought oh it's ridiculous she's just not as good as her male colleague Marty Martin uh Marty I think anyway uh one day by mistake, they swapped email. He, he, he logged on to email and it was under her name without realizing it. And straight away, he noticed the difference, the way these people were responding to him. They were just questioning his expertise. They were disrespectful. They were sort of implying he didn't know what he was talking about. And it drove him completely crazy. And when he realized what had happened, he said to her, is this what it's like for you? And she said, story of my life this is what happens the whole time this is why you manage to get through everything so much faster than I do because I get this pushback the whole time and so he decided as as an experiment to be her in fact they just swapped for two weeks and sure enough she found everything was a doddle he found it so much harder and had no idea until he'd experienced it himself proof positive and I, I, I find it because my name is if I shorten it to Ali it's indeterminate in a way um, and I find I don't have any any problem with emails because there's no question, there's no uh, issue about it, and that's partly why I'm so against the idea of putting pronouns in your in your email um, signature. You don't want to draw attention to that sort of thing and make more trouble for yourself, surely. Yeah, there were there's another couple of women who run who run a startup. And um, they were struggling to get men to respond to their emails. And so they just invented, you know, a fictional uh, partner called Keith Mann with a double yeah. N. And whenever they had trouble, they just emailed us Keith Mann and instantly the problems were resolved. That was brilliant, wasn't it? It was yeah. really, really good. And, and, and you have had the same problem talking about writing this book. You were told your basic premises was wrong. Oh, do you know, so I, I found <laughs> there were... There were two types of men. Uh, when I when I told men what I well, when I told women what I was writing about, almost to a woman, they said, "Yes, thank God you're doing this. This happens to me the whole time." When I told men that I was writing about it, most of them said, "Really?" in a sort of skeptical way. About a third of them would ask me intelligent questions about the book, just as you or I would to anyone else writing a book. But the other two thirds split into two camps. They either mansplained to me from a position of complete ignorance what I should be putting in my book, or also from a position of complete ignorance, they told me that I was entirely wrong, my thesis was out of date, and there was no point writing this book. And I thought, do you not notice the irony that you are actually exemplifying the very behavior that I'm writing about, the very subject of my book, at the same time as denying that it exists? And they just weren't even self-aware enough to notice that. It was extraordinary. Uh, how did you point it out to them? Were you were you blunt or, you know, the retort direct or were you nice to them? No, because I don't know. <laughs> I guess I've just been socialised, haven't I? I think yeah. now, probably. Now, now the book is out and I'm probably more confident about it. I would just take them up and say, do you not notice the irony? At the time, I, you know, in fact, funnily enough, a man did this to me in front of one of the first category of men, one of the very good, respectful ones. And the first category of man said to me afterwards, how do you put up with it? And I said, oh, I don't know. I just, it's, it's happened to me all my life. You know, what can I do? Just breathe deeply and smile. And It's extraordinary, know. isn't it? Really. Yeah. But, yeah. but in an ordinary sort of way. And I also noticed that men, <laughs> behave, men behave worse when they outnumber women and they improve when the ratio changes to female majority. Hello. Let's go back to... Uh, the host just muted me. I don't know if that was you, Alison. Anyway, no, no. Someone else, it's the second time it's happened. Anyway, um, <laughs> they're trying to silence me. <laughs> I hope not. <laughs> yes, it's true that um, if women make up a minority of a group, men will behave much worse towards them. They will interrupt them more uh, and they will talk over them more. If men are outnumbered by women in a group, they start to behave better. That's what the academic studies show. Yeah. And is there any merit in the idea that that, that uh, I think there was a, a Harvard professor wrote a paper about it, that women are naturally less well suited to leadership or to certain traditionally male careers in economics or STEM subjects? No, <laughs> I mean, they are less well suited probably to working on a building site. 
anything that involves upper body strength, but beyond that, no. Um, so in terms of leadership, quite a lot of studies have been done. In fact, an enormous meta study uh, of more than 100 leadership studies found that on average, women were actually slightly better leaders than men. Only on average, of course, there are some great male leaders, but on average, they're slightly better. They're particularly good at the form of leadership that works best, which is called transformational leadership, which is when you manage to inspire and engage your employees. Uh, you are less sort of directional and top down. You're more democratic. Um, women are particularly good at that. Some men are good at it, too, but on average, women are better. And actually, if you look at um, uh, when leaders are rated by the people who work for them, female leaders on average are, get higher ratings than male leaders, though male leaders will identify themselves as being better leaders than women will. I see. Um, <laughs> and also, sorry, you also asked about STEM fields yeah. and that sort of thing. Um, it is true that there are more men than women in STEM fields, and it's also true that more boys than girls on average. Um, actually, it's not just in the last couple of years it's changed. It used to be that boys tended to do STEM subjects more than girls for A-level. That has now changed apart from physics. Um, but the reason, if anything, is what, what economists call comparative advantage, which is so teachers will say to you when you're doing your A-level choices, do what you're best at. And girls outperform boys in every single country that has been studied in the humanities. They're just better than boys on average at the humanities. In STEM subjects, they're broadly equal in maths and very nearly equal in science. And therefore, if you're told to do what you're best at, boys are much more likely to choose maths and science because they're not as good at the humanities, whereas girls really have a choice of either. And that's probably why more girls end up doing humanities than boys. Uh, but if you, another study asked girls why they chose not to, to major in computer science at university. This was an American study. And the answers were not, I'm not interested in it, or I think the subject's too difficult. It was overwhelmingly because the girls thought there was gender bias in that subject. And they'd be mm. right. You know, they would have been studying along with boys who assumed they were going to be useless because they were female, who would patronize them because they were female, who would hang out with the other boys and not with the girls on the course. You know, it's not much fun that. So maybe having girly groups in schools to get them more confident at doing things like computer science might be a way to encourage more girls. But yeah. I, I really like the idea of the college. I think it was, I'm not sure if it was Canada or America, that, ha that titled the computer course, The Beauty and Joy of Computers, yeah. <laughs> and they got more girls. Got many more girls doing it, yes. Uh, I mean, there are all sorts of things, even, a, even a, an experiment where they redecorated the computer room, not to make it girly, but just to make it gender neutral looking. So instead of having loads of sort of very nerdy boys, Star Wars part posters and things up, they just had sort of normal art and a few potted plants. That, I think, doubled the number of girls using the computer room. So, um, you know, we send subliminal messages, don't we? And we can change those messages and it makes an enormous difference. In fact, one of the studies that I found most fascinating, uh, slightly changing the subject, but in terms of subliminal messaging, was um, girls on the whole will talk less than boys in public settings. And we'll probably come to that later. Um, and so female students were asked to, um, female and male students were asked to give a speech and they were given VR goggles so they could see this big audience and it felt like they were on stage. And the girls talked for much less time than the boys. Then they changed it so that they put a portrait at the very back of the hall, so sort of quite subliminally, they put a portrait of either Bill Clinton, Hillary Clinton, Angela Merkel, or no portrait at all. And when the portraits were of Hillary Clinton or Angela Merkel, the girls instantly talked for as long as the boys, and they talked more eloquently than when the posters were, the pictures were of Bill Clinton or none at all. And you think it's something that small. The slightest message. Yeah. I've I've heard also that if you ask, if you've got a, a group of people and you ask the first question to come from a female rather than a male, mm. that sets the tone for the evening then. Yeah, many more women will ask questions if you do that. Yeah, I always yeah. do it now. Yes, indeed. Um, okay, well, look, um, I, I like the idea that, that there are some simple things you can do to change the way that you get on and get, get involved in particular subjects. But I was really a, a, a staggered to find the stories you recounted about economics 
um, students that there was a, um, I think it was like a, uh, a, a bulletin board where mm. the talk was absolutely appalling. Yeah, um, I wonder if I can actually find it to quote for you. Um, it's a thing called economics job, job rumors and it's the sort of um, water cooler uh, uh, for people online for you know who's getting what jobs and gossip and that sort of thing yes. um, yeah uh, oh, hang on a moment sorry actually I didn't have a warning of this and I don't have it off the top of my head uh, yeah okay so the 30 words most often used by female economists are in order hotter lesbian baby sexism tits anal Marrying, feminazi, slut, hot, vagina, boobs, pregnant, cute, marry, levy, gorgeous, horny, crush, beautiful, secretary, dump, shopping, date, non-profit, intentions, sexy, dated, and prostitute. Those are all about women by and men. female economists. Um, about males, I know. Austrian. Males, okay. <laughs> Advisor, Austrian, mathematician, pricing, textbook, Wharton, Amazing, goals, greatest, and Nobel. It's extraordinary, isn't it? They're focused on the subject in the second case, yeah. and they're focused on the sex of the, the person they're thinking about in the first case. It's and not just not just the sex, but really misogynistic things. About Absolutely. That. Yeah. People. So you can understand why women, girls, might not take to that sort of environment mm. if they started studying, uh, if they started doing maths, for instance and had the opportunity to go into economics. If they found that was the ambiance, that might be a real turn off, mightn't it? I think it would. <laughs> yeah, and I, you know, I, I'm full of admiration for the brave women who do go into STEM fields and STEM careers, because this, yeah. this is the sort of thing they have to put up with. It's really disgusting and disgraceful. And I don't know why more men don't call it out. Um, I went to a girls' school, a grammar school, uh, but it was all girls. and. Um, all our teachers were women. So our chemistry teachers, physics, biology, you know, all our teachers were women. So there was no question of having differentiation, uh, different um, way of, of dealing with you, depending on the, the sex of the teacher. So I wonder whether there's a, a real case for more girls' schools. Yeah, I mean, I, I think the evidence is mixed. No, I think I, girls at all girls schools, I think I'm right in saying are two and a half times more likely to do A-level physics than girls at mixed schools. So yes, that sort of thing really helps. On the other hand, I sort of feel all girls schools are good for girls, but single sex education is bad for boys because yeah. I think boys get civilized by, up to a point at least, uh, by mixed schools, um, but girls don't, so. But as a mother of daughters, I. <laughs> You know, I, I don't think they should be the the, the caretakers. <laughs> yeah. Boys, really. Yeah. And actually, yes, we, we sent our girls to all girls schools and I think they thrived as a result. And yeah. one of them went to a mixed school for the sixth form because she said she wanted to be with boys and in some respects had a pretty, or certainly a hell of a lot of sexual harassment and that sort of thing. Really? Yeah. 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 And that's, that's yeah. echoed in what's been recently coming out this last year, hasn't it, about... Uh, um, and everybody welcome, I think it was, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, really horrible. Um, in, in chapter eight, you talked a lot about women and men reading different authors, uh, which helps explain why George Eliot still sells well. Um, and J.K. Rowling was advised to use her initials for her nom de plume. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about that, about the different way of reading? Yes, it's not, it's sort of even more nuanced than that, isn't it? Because it's not women and men read, it's women reading all authors and men reading only half the authors is on average, not all men, of course. Um, but on average, women will read roughly 50-50 books written by men and books written by women. For men, on average, the ratio is 80-20. So men will read four books by man for every book by a woman. Now, a lot of the bias that I write about in the book is actually held by women as well as men. But this is a particular phenomenon, which is only a male phenomenon. Some men simply not exposing themselves to women's voices or views in the first place. And how can they accord us any authority if they're just not even listening to us, reading our books, letting us into their newsfeed on Twitter? So, you know, you'll look at someone like Andrew Neil. You find that more than 80 percent of the people he follows on Twitter are men. 
So we're not even appearing in his newsfeed. Even those of us who, I don't think he follows me, even those of us who are expert in his field, i.e. politics, he's not even letting into his newsfeed. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. It really is. So, so do you get your male followers to retweet you so, so <laughs> he can read what you say ah. from his... That's another way of doing it. That's another way of doing it. I haven't specifically asked. And I don't, to be honest, I don't really care anymore. No. <laughs> but, I I did, but I did really fight with my publishers to get a cover design that men would that would appeal to men as much as to women. And in fact, I actually said to them, I want the sort of design, yes, you might want to hold it up, um, that a man would not feel embarrassed to be seen reading on the tube. Yeah. And it then I thought, look, how tragic. Yeah. yeah. But then I also thought, how tragic that a man would feel embarrassed to be seen reading a book by a woman. Because I would never feel embarrassed to be seen reading a book by a man. So what's that about? I mean, that, you know, that, that's part of what I'm writing about, isn't it? This sense of male superiority, thinking that women are somehow inferior and therefore it would be embarrassing to be seen reading a book by them. Yes, but possibly it is, but possibly it's also fragility. Maybe yeah. men's sense of their self is so fragile that they don't admit. And, and, and the sense that masculinity is so uh, uh, coerced in a way that they don't admit of any, any uh, falling off from the highest possible standard of knightly valour, that sort of stuff. Yeah, and actually men police each other very strictly. Indeed, this, indeed. Um, yes. I think more actually than women police each other about femininity. I think men police each other much more strictly about masculinity. And in yeah. fact, I was, I was talking about this the other day and a man said, do you know, he said, I was actually reading a book by a woman which had quite a feminine cover on a train and another man whom I'd never met actually came up to me and said, why are you reading that? <gasps> I know. <laughs> How dare he? What How a dare he? Yeah. And, and why would you not read that? Exactly. And, you know, men sometimes say to me, oh, well, it's all to do with the covers. And I say, but I'm very happy to read a thriller whose cover has uh, a very butch looking man silhouetted in black holding a gun, you know, yeah. and it's quite clearly aimed at men, this book. But if I've been told it's a good thriller, I'm perfectly happy to read it. How extraordinary that is, isn't it? And so there's obviously a market for people to, to be writing covers that are uh, neutral, mi mixed sex approval, if you like, mm. or, or that, that, that have got to be approved by blokes. Um, so that they can read Jane Austen without fear of being taken for, you yeah. know, um, not males. I mean, I, I kept sending back the design, the potential designs for my cover saying it's just it, 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 it's too wishy washy looking. It needs to be really bold, really graphic. It needs to look like an ad for Lynx deodorants or something. Very <laughs> angular as well. Very angular. No Very angular. No softness, softness about it. Yeah. And I also wanted, uh, though, actually my um, American one. Oops. is is much yeah. sort of softer looking that, anyway. that is different isn't it i, I don't understand why, why it doesn't look so nearly so uh red white and blue nearly so uh, definite as uh, as the uh, british cover no. so they know, they know their audience i suppose yeah Maybe i did also don't... say that sorry it's very hard not to interrupt each other on zoom i did also say that um i uh i wanted as many um quotes on the cover from men as from women you know endorsements yes. because I know that men are much more likely to listen to what other men say than what women say well you've got two two of each on, yeah. on this cover here yeah yeah but um uh, do you think that they had to have that do you think the American publishers didn't even think that they would get male readers it's a, possible I don't know I mean it's not actually a feminine cover it's just not no. quite as bold and graphic yeah, oh, that was true. But it's really interesting to see that. I wondered what the difference was and why they'd, why they'd done that. Um, so uh, in that chapter, when you're talking about writing and reading, um, there's a story that you talk about Camilla Shamsi, her account of being on a judging panel and, and kind of making a, drawing a line in the sand early on. Do you want to tell yes. us about that? Yes. So she was chairing a literary prize panel. Of judges and she said at the beginning now look this prize has only ever been won by I don't know five women and 40 men or something like that so let's just bear that in mind when we do our judging and then when it came to the long listing um, uh, a man had brought up two books by a woman and Kamala um, asked him you know what he thought of one and he sort of looked embarrassed and sort of went like this and it was quite clear he hadn't read it 
And she said, well, why are you proposing it then? He said, oh, it's just that, you know, at the first meeting, you said that we had to think about this sort of thing. Well, so it got on the long list because actually the women who had read it thought it was a terrific book. And then when it came to the shortlisting, this man was raving about this book and how wonderful it was. And, you know, she thought, well, if only he'd read it in the first place, he would have known this. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It was too much of an effort, I expect. Um, you've got a really great bibliography and, and a super index. It's so easy to find details. Um, I looked at the paper about the experiments in, in Egypt. Uh, it's uh, Masoud et al. using Quranic text to empower Arab women. It's page uh, 103. Um, and, and, and they found that 24% were more likely to accept the arguments for women in senior political leadership when they'd quoted positive uh, uh, Quranic verses from certain surahs. Now, you know, that sounds to me to be a really, potentially a really beneficial type of, uh, of, of attitude. Are you likely to get the, uh, the Mufti um, uh, uh, speaking about this, and giving a, a sermon about it? I don't, I, don't, I don't know. I don't know. I don't have any influence, I'm afraid. I don't know. <laughs> But, you know, I mean, we, we are battling most of the world's religions, aren't we? When we think about it, you know, almost every religion has told men that they are superior to women. That women must know their place. Women can't be priests, that women can't be bishops, that women can't be imams. That we, you know, I mean, just on and on and on and on. And yet, bizarrely, they also all of them teach the golden rule, which is basically do as you would be done by, you know, love your neighbor as yourself. And. Yes. If that's the golden rule, surely we should be treating women as we would like to be treated as men. So it's it's very odd that religions have perpetuated this horrible discrimination. And yet, isn't there a figure in your book uh, that uh, the GDP of, of uh, developing countries increases if women are uh, better ed educated? And oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, basically, the more gender equal a country is, the richer it's likely to be. As a result, um, the more gender equal a company is, the more money it's likely to make. I mean, in every statistic, basically get more women to the top and you will perform better. And we saw this during the pandemic as well, didn't we? And it's not surprising because actually, for a start, you are, you know, you are selecting from a, a, a talent pool that is twice the size. So it's sort of obvious, really, that if you, you Mary McAleese talks about it as like trying to fly on one wing. If you're not sure. taking women as seriously as men and, you know, and, and promoting them as much as men and that sort of thing. And it's rather beautiful. She says, um, she said to me, I don't know if you've ever seen a bird that tries to fly on one wing. It can't yeah. get elevation. It can't get direction. It flaps about rather sadly. And that's our world flapping about rather sadly because of the refusal to use the elevation and the direction and the confidence that comes from flying on two wings. Yeah. We all flourish. We all yes, flourish, she said. Men flourish, flourish, men flourish, we all flourish. Yeah. yeah. It's a really great um, uh, piece of that, isn't it? Yeah. Um, uh, you've got a, um, a, a chapter, chapter 12, on the intersexual problems of sex, class, race and disability, uh, and the way that women of colour are presumed incompetent. I mean, that is uh, extraordinary, well, extraordinary to me. I was staggered to read it. Um, can you expatiate on that a little bit? Yeah. So women in general are twice as likely as men to say <laughs> that they have to provide evidence of their competence and much more likely than men to say that people are surprised at their ability. And women of colour are nearly twice as likely as white women to say both those things, that they have to provide extra evidence of their competence, that people are surprised at their ability. And they're much more likely even than white women to say that their managers don't um, help with their career progression, that they find, you know, they don't have contact with senior leaders in their organizations. All the things that women in general complain about compared to men are multiplied if you're a woman of color. And then on top of that, even suppose you do get promoted to a great job or hired for a great job and you are completely brilliant and deserved it, people are going to say, I wish she only got it because she's a diversity hire, you know, affirmative action hire. Uh, however good she is. And it's terribly hard, you know, to prove that actually you got something like that on merit. I mean, women also suffer from that. People will say, oh, and you, you only got on that board because you're a woman. And I feel like turning around to the man and saying, well, hmm, I wonder whether you got your job because you were a man 10 years ago. <laughs> 
Uh, anyway, um, yes, and, and then women of color also have the problem that the racial stereotypes get overlaid on gender stereotypes. So suppose a black woman is standing up for herself in a meeting because someone's trying to interrupt her. Suddenly she's the angry black woman, you know, where it's actually yeah. she's perfectly yeah. justified in standing yeah. up for herself. Uh, and then uh, you have the same problem with working class women. You know, we judge people a lot by their accent in this country. I'm lucky enough to have a middle class accent, sort of BBC accent. So that means I get taken more seriously than someone, say, with a South London accent. Um, so class is a factor. Um, disability is that makes it so much worse. Women with disabilities that, you know, the authority gap widens much further. So, in fact, Sal Brinton, your president, um, I interviewed for the book. And she said, at least 50% of the time, people will address the person pushing my wheelchair rather than me. Mm. As if, yeah. because she's sitting down, she doesn't have a brain. And you all know how amazingly bright and assertive Sal is. Yes, yes. Yeah. It, it's, it's such a common thing. And, and so many of the stories in that particular chapter about black women, achievers, authoritative in, in any other, in any field, yeah. are being you know given discarded glasses to get rid of as if they're yeah, yeah. <laughs> coat to put away ask what the new is you know yeah. I would be so fed up I, I I don't know what you'd have to find a proper strategy for dealing with that and say oh well, I think you'll find the help is over there you know um, yeah. and direct them somewhere else you know? but uh, it must be so galling yeah uh, well there's that dreadful story about Dawn Butler the black yeah. Labour MP who got into a lift in Port Place House and a white Tory male MP said to her, this lift isn't for cleaners. <gasps> Can you imagine? I mean, it's bad enough for him to think that, but actually to say it? I mean, what, what sort of version of white male superiority was going on in his head? Yeah. It can't possibly show a, a lift with somebody who's a cleaner. Anyway, oh, no. he was a cleaner. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely appalling. Yeah. Um, in, in chapter 14, um, you cover the rise of online abuse as a means of means of silence in women. It's a really quite a dreadful chapter. Um, I was shocked to read just a few of the appalling threats that Caroline Criado Perez received when she simply suggested putting another woman apart from the Queen on a banknote uh, once Elizabeth Fry uh, left and was replaced by Churchill. Uh, can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, I'm actually going to read some of these out to you and they're very shocking. And I'm deliberately shocking you because a lot of the time people say, oh, women should just grow a thicker skin and, you know, just mute the people who do this to you on Twitter. OK, so after Caroline Criado Perez suggested this, she got enough rape and death threats against her to fill 300 A4 pages over one weekend. And they were things like. First, we will mutilate your genitals with scissors, then set your house on fire while you beg to die tonight. I have a sniper rifle aimed directly at your head currently. Any last words, you fugly piece of shit. Watch out, bitch. Women that talk too much need to get raped. Put both your hands on my cock and stroke it till I come on your eyeballs. Do as I fucking say or I'll slit your throat. I'm going to pistol whip you over and over until you lose consciousness while your children watch and then burn your flesh. A bomb has been placed outside your home. It will go off at exactly 10.47 p.m. on a time timer and destroy everything. Shut your whore mouth or I'll shut it for you and choke it with my dick, okay? Yes, extraordinary, isn't it? That's... Isn't it? Isn't it fascinating how many of these sorts of threats are to do with silencing us? sticking their dicks down our throats, cutting yeah. our heads off, cutting yeah. our tongues out. It is trying to impose a tax on women speaking in the public sphere. And the trouble is it works for a lot of women. A lot of women think, I'm not going to put up with this. I'm not going to go on question time because I know what will happen afterwards. I'm not going to tweet anyone. I'm coming off Twitter. It's just too painful. And, you know, the awful thing is it's not just women in the public sphere who get these threats. It could be a 13 year old girl putting up a video on YouTube about braiding her hair and she will get a rape threat in the comments section. And you, that's, that's so unbalanced, isn't it? It is so unbalanced. It is so disproportionate. I mean, you know, Caroline Criado Perez wasn't saying all men should have their balls cut off. 
she was just saying, shall we put Jane Austen on a ten pound note? I, I was I found writing the chapter so distressing. I can't tell you. I, I, I can imagine. I had to have breaks, to be honest, reading some of the chapters, um, just to just to go out and get a bit of fresh air. But yeah. it's really important book, and I think we need to we, we need to read it. Um, yeah. There's also a really interesting section about Laura Bates, uh, who's written a lot about everyday sexism. A lot of women will know about this. Quite a few men won't know anything about it. Um, uh, and uh, the way that some of the uh, activities that the youngsters get up to uh, looks as though it's grooming, radicalisation. Can you talk to us a little bit about that? Yeah. So Laura Bates has written a book called Men Who Hate Women, and it's about extreme misogyny. And she went undercover in what's known as the Manosphere online, which is a lot of groups of extreme misogynists. I mean, very extreme, often white supremacists as well. They tend to go together. Um, who are now grooming your sons, prepubescent sometimes boys, age 11, 12, 13, grooming them online through gaming websites, through YouTube, through supposedly innocuous channels in this extreme misogyny. And they're telling boys things like, white men are going to be wiped off the face of the earth, women are trying to take over the world, 90% um, of rape uh, accusations are made up by women. I mean, really horrible things that these boys are now learning online. And it's having an effect, which is very worrying, because I had at least half hoped that, you know, we would progress, that younger people would be less sexist than older people, that, you know, with time, all this would change. And I just wanted to speed it up. No, it's, there's actually becoming a real backlash. And she said that she, she's been going into schools twice a week for about 10 years now, giving talks uh, to teenage boys and girls. And she has really noticed in the last couple of years how the girls have been silenced by these boys with very extreme views. As soon as the girls start saying something very mild about equality, the boys will call them feminazis and worse. I find it very, very disturbing. That's another reason why single sex education might be a, an idea, although you'd like to think you could have them in the same school together. But, you know, if it's, if it's at risk to uh, girls' peace of mind and learning, it can't be. It must be really worrying. It is. But, you know, we've got to, you know, we live in a mixed sex world. <laughs> we do. That's right. That's <laughs> right. Join a nunnery. <laughs> Absolutely. I, 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 I'm really torn on this. Um, fortunately, uh, well, you know, it's it's uh, it's quite a hard thing. Um, I've got a question from T. Jones, who asks how much of the bias against women comes from other women? And I know that's uh, a chapter of your book. Yes, I've done a whole chapter on this because in quite a lot of the studies, women are as biased as men. So, for instance, there was a randomised controlled double blind trial in which... Uh, job applications and CVs were sent to science professors in American universities, an application for a lab manager position. And they were exactly the same CVs and letters, but they were randomly assigned male or female names. And the male candidate was significantly more likely to be hired, to be deemed competent, was offered a higher starting salary, and the professors were more interested in collaborating with him. And these are male and female science professors and the female science professors were as biased as the male ones. Because we have all grown up in a world in which probably our father earned more than our mother, probably worked more than our mother, maybe had more authority at home than our mother. We've all grown up in a world in which men have basically been in charge, still are basically in charge, although lots of women have got to, to senior jobs. Most of the people in charge are still men. We still have twice as many men as women in parliament. We have 92% of the FTSE 100 CEOs are men and only eight are women, you know. So we are still just more inclined to associate male with authority than female with authority. And when I say we, I mean women as well as men. Um, I made a, a Radio 4 programme about this, Women's Bias Against Women. And I asked listeners to imagine a hijacker breaking into the cockpit of a plane and attacking the pilot. And then I said, now, how are you picturing the pilot? I bet it's a white middle-aged man. And a woman called Margaret Oates tweeted, driving home in uniform, I was listening to this program. And yes, I pictured a white middle-aged male pilot, despite being a pilot. <laughs> so that just shows how ingrained it is in women as well as men. 
it, it's so pervasive, isn't it? And, and we see it right from infancy, don't we? In the in the the coloring books and the and the picture books that, that our children look at, it's, yeah. it's part of this furniture, really, isn't it? And by the age of five, uh, both boys and girls believe that boys are better at maths than girls, even though they're not, objectively not. And yet, I think there's something else you say, that if that you can turn that round, that didn't they do an experiment where the teachers did something different in the classroom for six weeks? Yes, that's right. That was It was a BBC documentary. And they just removed every element of sort of gender discrimination or stereotyping from the classroom. And they asked the parents to do exactly the same at home. And it had dramatic results. Girls became much more confident. Boys became much better behaved. Girls spoke out more. Boys were more emotionally intelligent. I mean, it was really very dramatic. It just shows what you could do if you bothered. I wondered if that carried on after they'd done the experiment. I don't know. Would that it need it reinforcing? I, I suspect it would need reinforcing over time as well. Otherwise, it could fall into disuse. You can do. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the final chapter is titled No Need to Despair, which actually, by the time you get to that, you need that title for the chapter. Um, yeah. Lots of changes needed in individuals, families, schools, colleagues, the media, government bodies and by politicians. Um, such as you, you, you specify making affordable child childcare tax deductible. That's a really good idea, isn't it? Um, and widely available too. Yeah. Uh, teachers resisting sex stereotypes, the self-esteem gap shrinks, as you've just said. What, what do you say are the most important changes we need? Well, you know, I counted the other day and there are 140 suggestions, solutions in, the, in that last chapter. Uh, and the reason there are so many is that every instance of the authority gap is relatively small. I mean, it's very annoying if you get interrupted when you're trying to make a point at a meeting, but it's not career ending. But they accumulate, they roll up like compound interest over the course of a lifetime to create this big gap. In, in opportunity and achievement between women and men. And so the solutions also have to be small, like noticing if you're interrupting women more and you know, biting your tongue and not doing it, um, affirming what women say at meetings and not just what other men say, listening more attentively to them. You know, there are so many things we can do. If you're a man and you want to sponsor or mentor a younger colleague, don't automatically choose someone who reminds you of what you were like at that age, but choose a woman instead, even better, a woman of color. Uh, but I think probably the two most important ones I would pick out from there are, first of all, that we must all accept that however liberal or intelligent or even female we are, we probably do harbour unconscious bias against women. I do. And I've written a book about it. And I'm a feminist. We all do because of the sneaky little stereotypes that are still sort of buried in the recesses of our brains. We can't put a lid on it. It's called unconscious for a reason. We can't, we shouldn't feel ashamed of it because it's not our fault, but we can notice when it manifests itself and then correct for it. And that's what I'm really asking everyone to do, just to be more aware and to correct for it. And if I had to choose one more thing, it would be stop mistaking confidence for competence because they're absolutely not the same thing. And so much of this happens because men on average are more likely to be overconfident to overassess their abilities than women and women are more likely to be underconfident or accurate. And I go, there's, there's lots of reasons why that is. Telling women just to be more confident doesn't help because we don't like confident women. <laughs> we haven't have talked about that. Um, but so don't mistake confidence for competence. Judge people by what they do, not by how good they say they are. And um, we've, we've got some questions now. I, that's, a, you know, that's a really interesting point. And I think we could all do well just to look at your chapter uh, your chapter, uh, final chapter, because it really is full of really good suggestions that we can institute at home, in our own families, in our workspaces, uh, just making this, the little bits of difference that would make life easier for everybody, actually. Um, so so it's really, it's, it's worth doing. Um, but we've got some questions from some of the people here. Uh, T. Jones wants to ask um, uh, how much of the... Uh, bias against women teachers at sea. Um, sorry, bear with me. It's one of the very, we hear reports that female teachers are judged more harshly by all pupils compared with male teachers. How does this tie in with the stats you mentioned about female leaders being judged well compared with male leaders? 
Yeah, I, I, it's interesting. But I know there was there was one study done of um, students who were being taught by an online instructor. So they didn't they hadn't seen this person. When they were told the instructor was male, they evaluated him, supposedly, much more highly than when they were told the instructor was female, even though it was exactly the same teacher. Yeah, so <laughs> that's extraordinary. So, exactly. So, um, yes, but why do we evaluate female managers more highly? Maybe because they just work so much harder at engaging their employees. That's, that's I what I think. And I think that for, for women or for women of, of colour in particular, actually to get to that, they've got to be so much better yeah. <laughs> to, to actually reach that stage, haven't they? I think that's right. So by the time you get to be a female manager, you've, yeah, you've had to go overcome so many obstacles. The chances are, on average, you're going to be better than a man who hasn't yeah. had those obstacles. Um, Doreen Wallace is making a, a comment or a question. I was always marked as a B or C at school until it got to exams when my sex was not stated. I then got A's. The mm. teachers were stunned when my results came back. They'd assumed that she was less able than, than she was. So do you think this is something that, uh, that, that makes a real difference to uh, assessment? Yes. I mean, that's why. See, girls outperform boys at every level of education from kindergarten through to PhD because exams are anonymized and objectively marked and girls just do better at them than boys. I'm not saying they're necessarily cleverer, but maybe they work harder. I don't know what it is. But anyway, they do outperform. Then when you get into the workplace, the evaluations aren't objective anymore and girls start and young women start to fall behind. And so one study showed that 70% of men will evaluate a man more highly than a woman for achieving exactly the same goals. And it's a rude shock to women when they're young women, when they get to the workplace, because they think, you know, all, all through their life so far, they've actually done better than boys. And they think, well, I'm going to be fine. You know, um, but all these older women telling, telling us how sexist the world is. Oh, no, no, no. I found it's absolutely fine. And yeah, I think it's quite a rude shock. Um, we've got a question, a kind of combined question by Thalia and Juliet uh, about misogyny as a hate crime. It's a contentious topic amongst feminists, lots of different views about it. Uh, Juliet says, I'd like to ask Mary Ann if you support the legislation about misogyny. I think I would just because I think it will make people think more about it. And what worries me is that um, I mean, racism is an abomination, but I do think in lots of people's minds, particularly young people's minds, it's taken a lot more seriously than sexism. And I think that's probably wrong. So, I mean, I was expecting, for instance, young men to be much less sexist than old men. They're not, bizarrely. They're just as sexist. And yet these are millennials and Gen Zs whose antennae are acutely attuned to any suggestion of racism or homophobia or transphobia. Um but not when it comes to sexism or misogyny, in effect. So, you know, I, I think I would quite like to see misogyny treated on the same level as those, because we've just got to take it more seriously. Yeah. Um, uh, here's Doreen again saying, when my daughters ask what salary to ask for in a new job, I say, what would a man ask for? <laughs> Yeah, but, you know, an awful thing is that th th here's an example where men are much more biased than women. Male hirers are five times more likely to say they don't want to work with a woman who negotiates than with a man who does, whereas female hirers um, don't mind. So, you know, people say, oh, well, the gender pay gap's all women's fault. If only they asked for more money, they'd get it. Actually, they get punished for asking for more money by men anyway. Yes. Now, uh, we've got a question here, which asks, can you share the 140 suggestions? I think it would take half an hour. No, you have to get a book. Sorry. Yeah. But, I mean, but borrow, I... borrow it from a friend or borrow it from a library if you like. You don't have to buy it, but I can't go through 140 now, I'm saying. Yeah, I think mm. T. Jones, uh, we don't know what sex T. Jones is, and so we're not going to make any um, suggestions, but get hold of a copy, borrow it or self-gift it or, or, or get it from the library. And... Um, then you can promote them, set challenges, T. Jones says, with friends, family and colleagues. That's a really great idea. It's a lovely and, idea. Yes, yes, please. We have an interbranch competition, couldn't you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, anybody else with any more questions? I think I think we've looked at all of the questions in the. Uh, in the chat. Um, 
somebody's saying here, Sue's saying, on the other hand, imagine the voice of somebody talking bollocks. What voice do you hear? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. There, um, there was a study done um, called uh, Bullshitters, Who Are They? And something, I can't remember the rest of the title. And uh, they, it was 15-year-olds in lots of different countries. And they set them, they, they gave them 16 mathematical concepts and asked them to say uh, whether they'd heard of them, whether they understood them, how comfortable were they using them. And they had deliberately slipped in four completely non-existent mathematical concepts. And of course, <laughs> the male teenagers are far more likely than the female <laughs> ones in every country to say, oh, yes, I know that one. I've heard of it. Feel comfortable using it. <laughs> Extraordinary, isn't it? Whereas, uh, it, are you saying then that women are less afraid of admitting ignorance? Yeah. And more willing to own up to not knowing? I think that's partly it, because if you look at the way men and women bond, it's exactly the opposite. So men will very rarely admit vulnerability to each other. They bond through sort of showing strength, being a bit competitive. Uh, if you look at boys talking together, a lot of it is sort of boastful competitiveness. You know, my dad's got a better car than yours. I've scored more goals than you have. With girls and women, it's exactly the opposite. So it's competitive self-deprecation. It's, right. you know, uh, I'm useless at maths. I hate my hair. My bum's too big. And that's how they bond. And therefore, but women and girls actually bond through admitting vulnerability. And men do the opposite, which is why men sometimes feel uncomfortable and think it's a sign of weakness when a woman will say at a meeting, oh, could you explain that? I didn't understand that. Whereas they will look it up later, but they won't want to admit to not understanding it at the time. Oh, in, in the past, I've, I've actually asked those sort of questions because I know that lots of people aren't going to know and I don't care. Yeah. <laughs> so exactly. I, I've got nothing to lose by asking. So at least it gets over the idea that we do need to know what they're talking about. So, so um, I think it depends how big you are, really. I mean, I don't mean uh, I don't mean physically, but how um, how confident you are that th it doesn't matter. Yeah. Uh, just how um, how comfortable you are in your skin, exactly. Maybe. Yeah. Um, yeah. Now, uh, oh, let's see. Have we got another question? I think we we've nearly come to the. Oh, okay. Not to eight o'clock, anyway. Yep, yeah, that's uh, that's just a, a actual chat. Um, I think we've had as many questions. Unless anybody's got a a, a last minute question you'd like to ask. I could go on talking to you for hours about this because it's I, th I found a really interesting book um, and well worth reading um, and well worth talking about to other people. Um, and, and as one of the reviewers said, it's an impassioned, meticulously argued and optimistic call to arms for anyone who cares about creating a fairer society. And she said, now we just have to get the men to read it. <laughs> That's a big challenge. 